This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Michael Westmore, Oscar winner, artist in the truest sense of the word artistry. He is a makeup artist. He is a continuation, a link in a makeup artistry dynasty. Reality television star, mentor, and dad. Known for creating entire races of Aliens and cave people, iconic imagery. You're going to see some of it in just a few moments. Not to mention classic human icon iconography, like Sylvester Stallone's bloody face in Rocky, Robert De Niro's face in Raging Bull, and one this guy for turning Eric Stoltz, our fellow Santa Barbarian Eric Stoltz, into an entirely different person that you're going to see very soon in the film, the Oscar-winning movie, Mask. And by the way, along the way, in addition to this guy, there were nine Emmys, 40-plus nominations. There was, I think, a 20-year period where you were nominated every single year for major awards. You are legend. You are descended from legends. You are the father of legend. And most important, a gaucho. Welcome back, Michael Westmore. Um, I have a tendency of going off on tangents, so if I do start going somewhere and we need to get pulled back, pull me back. Okay. Uh, but I'll get a little bit of my family history. My grandfather was actually Winston Churchill's barber, and he uh, brought the family, part of the family, over to the United States uh, in around 1915, and Little by little, because he was a barber and a wig maker, and he used to make wigs for the prostitutes, and instead of money, he used to, you know, they barter. Um, fair trade. Fair trade. So when the movie started to occur, grandfather got the idea to try to pull it all together. There were actors who weren't doing really well at acting, clowns that weren't interested, uh, hairdressers, and they formed a guild. And then they started a, uh, this, this, this guild, which is like a union. But how it actually happened was that my Uncle Purse and Uncle Earn, who were then very young, were teenagers, and they would run the shop when grandfather wasn't there. They would literally hand tie all the wigs and mustaches, and one morning, an actor came in who had accidentally shaved off half his mustache. <laughs> and Purse happened to be there. And so they, he was looking for my grandfather. He wasn't there. So Purse actually hand-tied a duplicate to the side that he had shaved off, put him on. He went back to the studio, the actor did. And they were so thrilled that they came back to the shop where the family got involved with the, the motion picture business then in the 1920s. Uh, the actor was Adolf Manjou, and they were making the original silent version of The Three Musketeers. Uh, so that was the picture. And then the next big one that came along was King of Kings, which my entire family was involved in, grandfather running it. Um, there was a, a point where the studio was trying to get rid of some people, too. And uh, grandfather took and chopped Christ's beard up into uh, you know, a thousand piece puzzle and he was the only one who had to put it back together again. So they weren't able to, fight, uh, to get rid of anybody in the family. Everybody stuck around for that venture. Um, it went on and on and little by little grandfather brought each one of the sons into the business. My dad who was the oldest, Monsignor, uh, was Rudolph Valentino's personal makeup artist. 
he went on to do his final picture. He, he passed away when I was only 18 months old. But his final picture was Gone with the Wind. And then there was Peirce, who took over Warner Brothers, uh, did Quasimodo. He was Betty Davis's personal makeup artist. I inherited her near the end of her career, and we could talk about that. That was, wasn't fun for me, but uh, <laughs> Peirce did 30-some pictures with her. Uh, there was Uncle Ern, who was uh, one of the real artists in the business. And uh, Wally, who was at Paramount, uh, was with uh, uh, Dorothy L'Amour and Bob Hope and all the road pictures. And he did uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, not Hunchback, uh, that was Purse that did, did Hunchback. Um, I can't think of it right away. Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Oh, that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, that, that was, each one of them had some really big picture that they're known for. Uh, then uh, Frank came along, who was the, or Bud, Bud did uh, uh, Creature in Black Lagoon and was at Universal when they were doing a lot of the uh, early films after Jack Pierce had created Frankenstein and Wolfman. Bud came in and took over the studio for, in 1947 and was there for many years after that. And then Frank was Cecil B. DeMille's uh, makeup artist that he used to travel with him. And as a note, there's a brand new book that's just coming out now on Cecil B. DeMille, if you're interested in that, that's absolutely gorgeous. His granddaughter, Cece, she is a, a contributor to the book. And when she was eight years old, she went to live with him. The houses were close together, but she preferred kind of staying with Grandpa than going home. So she traveled the world with him mm. through all this t time. And so this big, thick book talks about archival things with Cecil B. DeMille, and Cece talks about how her adventures intertwined with the adventures at the same time. And it's about an inch and a half thick. And uh, I thought, I, I literally just saw it last night. Um, and it's like $65. I can't believe it. To me, it's a coffee table book that probably ought to be $165. Where the, there's plates in there and pictures and everything that are absolutely gorgeous that they literally have pulled out of the archives that have never been seen before. So, uh, and, and costume dressings. He was, he was, DeMille was very in, into uh, wanting to see everything and how it was done. Uh, uh, you know, true master of the epic, epic films. Um, so that's basically m my background there. I was, uh, as I said, I, out of high school, I had no idea where I was going. I went to Arizona to look at the school. I thought about going to the University of Mexico. Uh, that didn't work, so I drove up here with a friend of mine who was enrolling, and that's all it took. Uh, I enrolled at the same time and enjoyed uh, the, the time here. I lived in a, one of the, you don't have them anymore. We had Quonset huts out by the slough, and that's where I lived to start with, and then uh, I joined a fraternity and lived on campus here uh, around the corner. But, you know, all the, all the things that are fun about college, and you, you'll look back at it in 20 or 30 years, and you'll, you'll realize what a good time you're having here uh, now. It's, uh, it's a really important part of your life, and, and to learn everything you possibly can, because that's all, everything you're learning now is going to be a building block for your uh, education and your life's work later on. How many here are interested in film? Just about every, well, a lot, okay. Uh, th there's so much, which I, I, it's hard to wrap my head around it because they keep making films so fast now, and the new film students are making great little documentaries and things, but there's so much of the old films that you need to look at, and this is one of the things that Martin Scorsese did. Uh, he had um, uh, asthma, really bad, so what his mother would do when he was a little boy was to put him into the theater at noon in New York and leave him there till six, seven o'clock at night because of the air conditioning. And then she'd take him out. So Marty actually saw movie after seeing the same movie over and over and over again. And so all this is imprinted in his mind. And uh, I had the chance of doing New York, New York with uh, Robert De Niro. Uh, and it was a fascinating to watch them work because De Niro and, and he would, uh, and Minnelli at that point, would do a scene and you hear Marty say, oh, that's great. That's absolutely perfect. One more time. And this one more time would go to the point where we would shoot one page a day. So it was a 120-page script. We would shoot for 120 days wow. instead of 30. 
It, was, uh, it always doubled itself like that. So he was a fascinating person. I've had the opportunity of working with many actors, many directors. Uh, another one that, was, that I loved was John Huston. Uh, he did the voice of Gandalf in Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings and uh, we were in Europe, and I would, I would walk up behind him, and I'd say, do Gandalf. <laughs> and he would start in the Gandalf. You know, so. But uh, it was fun, because he didn't like to work late. We were in Hungary, so, and I had Marion and the kids with me, and we, we'd wrap at 4 o'clock every day, which was super, because we had the rest of time off, and he didn't like to get up early in the morning, so we didn't start shooting until 8 o'clock. So our days were very short, but uh, filled up through that time. So getting back to Santa Barbara, I finally had the opportunity. My uncle called me from Universal Studios and said, I have an apprenticeship open, which apprenticeships aren't really available anymore. They stopped uh, the program many, many years ago. And I was a junior at the time, and I said, I'm really, I mean, I'm interested, but I want to graduate. Nobody in my family had ever graduated from college, and that was uh, very important to me. So Bud said, if I keep it open for a year, will you take it at that point? And I said, okay, it sounds good. Uh, I was planning on going to Berkeley to do graduate work in art history, but I thought, no, oh, I'll go to the studio, and if I don't like it, I'll you know, quit and go back to school again. So in starting at Universal, I had the opportunity to work with a man by the name of John Chambers. Does anybody know that name? Okay, John Chambers was the man who did Planet of the Apes the original Planet of the Apes. Uh, he was brought over to the studio to do um, a film called List of Adrian Messenger. It's a film in which Kirk Douglas and Tony Curtis, Robert Mitchum um, were played characters. And you didn't know who they were through the movie until the very end of it when they stripped off their masks. So it was a, it was a big challenge and it was the largest budgeted makeup film until they made Planet of the Apes. Now you might think, know who John is, because if you've seen the film Argo, Argo was John Chambers. John was hired by the CIA to work on silicone and to create that deception that they used to go in to get the people out of Iran when the uh, thing. So the John Goodwin, who was uh, starred in the thing, actually played the part of John Chambers. And, uh, John was a, a wonderful man. He was my mentor. And I literally stood by his elbow for three years, and every time he opened his mouth, I wrote it down. I still have that black book, where how to do a black eye, where to buy materials, how to make teeth. Um, I would say how, how to make teeth. If you're familiar with Star Trek, I made every pair of Klingon teeth, I made every pair of Ferengi teeth. It's like I love doing it because it got me away from having to do budgets and other things. Be able to get lost up in the lab and, and make teeth, which, and, and uh, get a good smell of acrylic that uh, would just about, you pass out. Hopefully it was only one or two pair at a time, but you had to do seven pair. It was, uh, it was a nightmare. So it, uh, I went to the studio and spent three years in an apprenticeship and really enjoyed the time in my apprenticeship because every six months I had to learn something different. The first six months I watched my uncle make up Sandra D every day. Learned how to put on eyelashes. In fact, the first girl I practiced on, I glued her eyes shut putting her lashes on. Um, and learned the techniques of doing blush. So I was trained in all facets of it. That's why when I got into Star Trek, I was involved in doing the beauty makeup, tying the beauty makeup into the alien features that I had on the, uh, on the women, you know, making Klingon and Ferengi and Cardassian women and everything. And uh, so you would know they're a woman uh, underneath all the, the, the makeup that we had to do. Uh, went through every six months after the three years, I took an examination and became a journeyman. And the f first thing I did was a McHale's Navy. And what <laughs> do they do? They assign my mother on the show too. So here I have my mother behind my back. Um, and there's, there's timing that you need to do. So my mom, who was only about five foot two, would stand behind my back 
and when it was time to go and powder a nose, I would feel a finger <laughs> go like that. So <laughs> I learned my timing from mom. She was a hairdresser, and she used to make false eyelashes um, and, and worked on a lot of the big, big films over the years. So I grew up in a motion picture family, and my entire background, which I can say I really enjoyed over the years, the studying, the learning, and to me, the final product was always important. It had to be real, it had to look right. And now, uh, although I'm on a reality show, an unscripted reality show, um, the, 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 the techniques and things, I wanted to learn everything I possibly could. But there's been advancements now in silicone, which you've seen in so many of the movies that, uh, th that have come out now that are absolutely brilliant makeups, and I love them to be able to go and, and look at them and, and talk with the makeup artists. Uh, we go to the academy and see films and, and talk with the guys and find out new techniques and things which are always changing. People are always trying to think up new things to do. So, where do we go now? Where Do you want to show this little bit of footage here? I think that'd be fantastic. Okay, yes. we're gonna, I, can, I can talk while it's going on, too. Okay. I, I've got, uh, this is some of the projects that I've done over my career. Raging Bull with De Niro um, was probably one of my greatest experiences. I was on it for 18 months, and he used to come to the house all the time and he was playing with my daughter, Mackenzie, and Marion said, watch, something's up. Well, it was. At the end, Robert asked us if Mackenzie could play the part of his daughter in Raging Bull, and that's how she got into SAG. These were all the things. Uh, today, it could be an optical. At that time, everything was done with tubes and, and blood and syringes. So as we spent uh, two weeks just doing all the effects in Raging Bull, that occurred in the ring. And he went through a couple different stages. This was stage two, where he actually gained weight. He put on, he went from uh, 155 to 185, and then he went up to 215 for the final scenes in Raging Bull. Uh, I was with Stallone uh, for eight years, uh, with uh, the Rocky films and First Blood, and this was a little scene in, in uh, First Blood where we uh, had to sew up his arm and I had attached to that uh, intravenous baby, uh, a tube for feeding babies that was so small, it got plugged with one grain of sand and Sly was able to work it out with his thumbnail. Uh, spent a lot of time on Clan of the Cave Bear. It was a large production. There was no way you could do the book. All I could do was pick out a small segment. But I had foreheads and noses and teeth and everything on all these guys. This is a, actually a bald cap on uh, the character called Zoo, who was the storyteller. But this is uh, interesting in that every night they would stick their teeth in their pockets when they're coming home, and I would pray that I only have to repair about three or four sets, because I couldn't go to dinner until it was over with. So I'd be ready to work. We, we flew in helicopters every day into the mountains. Uh, this was a head actually made out of wax, which is a scene where a bear kills this guy and they chop his head off and eat his brains. Hmm. Simple, you know, everyday thing. <laughs> That's what it looked like finished. Wax was a, was a great medium. Now today that would be made out of silicone and it would look just about exactly the same. That's how the setting was where uh, they, they find it where the shamans all sit around and uh, have breakfast. <laughs> Masters of the Universe was another real joy. Again, this is pre-visual effects. Uh, those ears on the character called Gwildor were run by cables that were 30 feet long, and they were done with joysticks. And my son Michael at the time was running, there. that's Gwildor in his makeup, uh, the director would just take his finger and point, and Michael would work the joysticks wherever they wanted to do the ears and flip them around. Today, it would probably be run by little motors. Beast Man was another one of the characters. Tony had uh, huge teeth in his mouth. He didn't have to talk, so wasn't worried about uh, that. Although, when we had the Ferengi in uh, Star Trek, I had to make the teeth and the Klingons 
so the people could talk with them in their mouth. <coughs> this is an illustration, a sketch. There we had, uh, there's one place where a character ages. So we did that there in, in her final <laughs> scene. In fact, she hated the act, it was Christina Pickles. She hated putting that makeup on so much, and she wouldn't put it on the second day. But uh, we finally, you know, we got through it. So this was Sorod, and they, if you notice the contact lenses that were there, this was before contact lenses were comfortable. Those were full sclerol shells that had to go into the eye. There's Skeletor, Frank Langella, uh, played Skeletor, and I've done other shows with Frank over the years. Really nice, nice person and he also had to wear teeth. And in the nose and in the eyes, I had a, a screen that was very sheer. He could see out, but you can't see into it. Tying the beauty makeup into it too. And of course, Rocky, um, one of my favorites at, um, I had these little plastic pieces over Sly's eyes, and to this day he still claims I tore out his eyebrows. But uh, <laughs> Burgess Meredith, I had uh, cauliflower ears on him, again, were made out of plastic, and um, a little nose piece and, and a plug up his nose to pull it to the side. And it would get to the point with the long hours, the pieces would start to come loose and perspiration would get behind him and they wouldn't go back down again. So I would literally just take Vaseline as opposed to trying to glue them down, give it a good coat of Vaseline and push it down in that final scene of Rocky in the scene with, uh, with Adrian. Uh, those things are being held on with prayers and Vaseline. <laughs> this was a, a movie of the week called Annihilator where again, if you've seen this many movies where being you know, a part of the face gets knocked away. But this is uh, one of the first uh, attempts at doing this type of a makeup. Iceman was uh, Norman Jewison, went up, we actually worked on the, uh, the icebergs, uh, we worked out on the bay. Uh, they told us when we were working there that if the ice breaks up while we're out there, stay on the ice flow, don't jump in the water because you'll die if you go in the water. But at least we may be able to find you if you stay on the ice. You think, think I'm making a movie. Do I really <laughs> want to give my life you know, to doing that? And we, there was another night, well, this is John Lone doing his makeup. There was another night where we were on top of a glacier on the side of it. And the director was told that we had to leave and he kept shooting and shooting and shooting. And we got fogged in. And so they told us, well, we may have to stay here overnight. It's like, oh, good luck, you know? And, but he had gear to be able to, uh, first of all, to literally survive there and sing Kumbaya and do s'mores and things. <laughs> but um, all of a sudden, the light opened up, a little patch did, and they threw us in the helicopter. We had one helicopter. And he, little by little, there weren't that many of us in, in three trips, were able to get us off the glacier and down the mountain. The only thing that bothered me was, on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights, I called home, and this was Wednesday night. And I could just see the hotel saying, I'm sorry, your husband hasn't come back. He's out on a glacier, you know. This was a movie with uh, Keith Carradine called Blackout, uh, where half his face has uh, been destroyed. And what I had fun with this was, is how do you tie it into his head? There it is in makeup. And with the hair, and I used little springs there to literally hook into the rubber piece across the top of his hair, pull him, open him up, and hook him down into his hair so I didn't have to glue, there, you can see it there, so I didn't have to glue it down, uh, his hair into his scalp. Johnny Hansen was a film I thought was going to be another Oscar winner because uh, Al Pacino was supposed to do it, Richard Gere was supposed to do it. It finally got down to Mickey Rourke, and I spent about a year and a half with the doctors at UCLA. This is a combination of a couple different bone diseases on this character. And this is how he looks at the beginning of the movie. He has plastic surgery, looks like himself, comes back, kills the bad guys. Um, but the, the makeup and the transformation 
was interesting uh, to the point where it, it was a real challenge and I thought we really did it well. And I lost to Driving Miss Daisy. Hmm. This was an interesting film, true story. Uh, why me, Glennis O'Connor, of a lady who's caught her face in her steering wheel when she fell asleep at the wheel and she had to go through facial reconstruction. So that's what the entire two hours was about, was her going through the facial reconstruction. There is right after the accident. And then we had different stages of it. I actually got to, to meet the doctor who did the surgeries and he left his surgical nurse with us on the show to be my technical advisor. Uh, there's one point where Glennis has her mouth all sutured shut and I, we, we did, here it is, and I left a little hole there, as you can see, because we could stick a straw through there and we could drink chocolate malts. Thing is, I like chocolate malts too, so Glennis gets one, Michael gets one also. <laughs> but she wanted to see how people would react to that. Went to a store uh, like Rite Aid and walked around and checked out, and she says it was so interesting, people wouldn't look at her. Mm. That once they saw her out of the corner of their eye, they wouldn't make eye contact, even when she went to check out with all the things she put in the basket. She wanted to see how she would be accepted. And it, uh, nobody would really stop and stare at her. Blood of Heroes is a show that I did in Australia with Rutger Howard. We actually lived in a cave, which was a hotel. It was built into a cave out in Cooper Pedy, Australia, where all the opal mines are. And this was a sci -fi. This is really an interesting film. It's a sci-fi film about the future and these teams would play a, this really bloody football game against each other. And then the winners would get uh, you know, wine, women, and song, and the losers would get kicked out of town. But each one of these characters developed from almost nothing into, these char into the, what you're, you're seeing now. It was, uh, as I said, an interesting film to me because I had to, in the middle of it, the same man was doing the uh, Johnny Handsome. So I had to leave Australia and get back to the US because I was supposed to do a face cast on Al Pacino for, uh, for the show. And then he dropped out and we had a, it's interesting uh, how they have a lineup. Somebody will make their, the producer will make a wish list up of the people he would like to be in the film. So we kept going down the list uh, of people until we wound up with Mickey Rourke. This is Vince D'Onofre. He's been, uh, in a, you've seen him a lot. He's been in a lot of detective shows. But this is when he was starting out in his career. And we had, both teams had uh, uh, five, six players on them. So what you're seeing is each one of the people that were in just, you know, scrapes and bruises and scars and dirt and uh, nonstop uh, blood and guts. 2010, um, when they made 2001, they destroyed everything that they had in the movie. They destroyed all of the appliances. They destroy, destroyed uh, all of the sets, everything. So I had to duplicate Kier Delay's makeup by taking a frame out of the movie, blowing it up into 11 by 14. And that was my research to try to build all these individual pieces. I'm here, we were sculpting them out. Here's Kier Delay. This was a makeup that took five, about five and a half hours. And he's into yoga. He would literally go into a yoga state and jump out of the chair five hours later, uh, totally rested. And at one point, they put a camera underneath our makeup station that took a picture like every 10 seconds. And it was all compiled into a one minute movie. So a uh, little documentary thing. Uh, went very fast, but it all had to be powdered down. Even this here, the technique for using this is rubber grease that Max Factor made, had to powder heavily. Since that time, um, a man by the name of Dick Smith invented a product called Pax, which is a, a combination of acrylic paint and a water-soluble glue, 
and it literally bonds into the latex and will not come off. The, the way we did makeups in the past, which is even on here, would have to be powdered and really touched up well uh, about two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon. This is the movie I got the Oscar for, Masked, with uh, Eric Stoltz. And I had pictures from the real boy. He died when he was 16 years old, uh, lived uh, down Southern California, and that's a picture of the real boy. Look, his eyes are three and a half inches apart. So Peter Bogdanovich, the director, asked me what my requests were. I said, well, it'd be nice if we could find somebody whose eyes are far apart. Uh, and he hires Eric Stoltz, whose eyes were about an inch apart. So the, the bridge that I have on Eric is only an inch and three quarters. But they did a, a, a musical, Call Mass the Musical, that played in Pasadena, and they intercut the, uh, the real boy and Eric in the, uh, in the play, and it was amazing, because I mean, I could see it. Other people couldn't see what was going on with the, this Terry Gar when I got the Oscar. I think that's it on those. I want to start out by asking you, looking at this, when you are presented with a challenge like creating a different race or a different genus of humankind, mm -hmm. um, how much of it is your invention and your research, and how much is presented to you by art directors? Uh, the percentages break down very interesting. It's uh, zero art directors and 100% Michael. I was really? never told what to do. Is that because you are you, or is that, is that really the makeup artist's? Um, it, 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 I would get my scripts and it would say alien. And they'd say, you know, come up with something. I think it went beyond, uh, in Star Trek, it went beyond really uh, of the, them having any idea what they wanted. And so it was left up to me, and Marion and I, we would go shopping, book shopping, every, every season we started a new one. I would go out and find new books on, on insects, on fish, on birds. And in fact, when you look at Star Trek characters, when you, you think you're going to try to come up with some new wheel or whatever, I found it so much easier to take components from different people. So when you look at a Star Trek alien, things look familiar, but they aren't familiar. Um, like with the Cardassians. Um, they're kind of lizard-like and shell-like, and another one called the Jemadar, which were based on dinosaurs and rhinoceros. So I would find, or uh, D Disney had, uh, when they had the Lion King going, and I had to come up with Neelix. I kind of threw all the little animals in Lion King, because they said, come up with something cute that we can make a doll out of. So I used the meerkats, the boar, and threw that all into Neelix's makeup. So is this just, are you just having so much fun? Best job in the world. Pulling pieces together and, Best. and, and, and letting your imagination go wild. Exactly. So would you say that for somebody who wanted to be a makeup artist, having an imagination, having that creativity is a, real, is a key component besides all the technical skills? It, it depends on how far you want to go with it. If you're just going to do beauty makeup, no, you can find that very quickly. Uh, when it comes down into lab work and sculpting, that you, 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 need, to have, you need to have it in the hands you, you, and, the, and the imagination. And that's why I really enjoy uh, Face Off so much, is because they really bring some talented people in there. And especially when we get down to the last four or five people, any one of them could usually win. But it's the one that has time management that survives. Mm. They all kind of, are, they can sculpt by that point, they can make molds by that point, uh, they can paint by that point, but if they spend too much time on any single element and they ruin their time management, because uh, th I, I was a judge too, and I know the judges, I mean, we're all good friends, so I know what they're gonna look for. And I, I, I can tell, I can advise somebody of what I think and over, over the years, uh, somebody will say, well, Mr. Westmore told me such and such, but I want to do such and such. All of a sudden, they're off the show because I'm giving them a heads up of what not to do. And V or Neville or, you know, Glenn, they're going to catch them. Yeah, if there's anything we've learned from reality TV, it's listen to your mentor. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. But have, do you find that, okay, moving on to that for one second, do you find that the contestants are getting wiser about how to play the game? Have they learned oh, I, from I, watching I other people's mistakes? I think on every mistakes? reality show. Yeah. yeah. Except for the Kardashians. They haven't caught on yet. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, they're not, I mean, they're not exercising no. a skill, <laughs> as it were. No, I'm kidding. Um, but, but then, uh, okay, so, so staying with Face Off for a second, yeah. as people get hip to the game, does the game have to keep, do you have to keep raising the game and changing the challenges in order to keep them off their, well, off what, their mark? And what actually raised the challenge is that on season four, when they brought me in from being just uh, a guest judge to, to mentor them on a weekly basis, because I, I have maybe a minute or two or three of footage every week, but I'm really with them for a couple hours. And we talk about everything, how thick their sculptures are, uh, how thin they are if it's not going to work, uh, if it doesn't really look like it, if they say they're doing a pig and it looks like a monkey, uh, you know, I'll have to tell them that. And just, I'm not mean, but I, I'm really honest with them as if I was doing a show and these people were working for me. And this is what I had to do on Star Trek all the time too is keep all my sculptors in, once I had a design and a concept, and I had talked it out with the director and the producer that to, to keep them not going off on some track, unless they came up with a better idea, something that was very clever. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, and that's why people like working on Star Trek, is because I really encouraged creativity for them to get in and really do stuff. We had a, a thing, called Westmore Alien, especially it originated on Deep Space, where I had, after we did all these different races, I had a box full of noses from all the different races, a box full of foreheads, a box full of ears, and we would pick out a pair of ears from this race, then bum, 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 all these different things, and it was like a Mr. Potato Head. That sounds like such a fun game. So a lot of the background, in fact, all of the background characters on Star Trek are Westmore Aliens, that uh, they could put, and we had walls of um, stencils. So you could say, okay, make this one red and pink and whatever, and put black spots on them, type thing. And just like and, make your own. And let them go. And I could leave and go do something else, because I, I hired really great talent, too. So I could turn my back and go away. There's only a few times, uh, I know on a, on a Vulcan one time, he put the ears on backwards. And so instead of points coming up this way, the points were going to the back. And I had to change it. You know, we had little things like that to go on. Uh, but it, it didn't happen that often. Everybody really knew what to do. But it could be a mutant Vulcan, too. No? Uh, I, I can just hear the, me telling that the producer. <laughs> no. <laughs> now that's a Westmore alien. That looks like a Westmore alien. That's, that's lots of that's faces. That's put together. The head's from something else, and the nose is from something else. That wasn't, though. This was a show where they landed on a planet where there were dinosaur, humanoid dinosaurs, and they thought the humans were really strange. These are all different things. Little uh, a tree branch. These were all little bugs that were either run with wires and things. This was the design character. Did, did you design this character? Yeah, all of them. Yeah. Do yeah. You, do that you was a pair of twins. <laughs> do you just have things at home like this? No. OK. <laughs> No, if it's interesting. I'm sorry, we want to know. Uh, no, it's one of the questions I get so many times is, do you do drugs? Um, <laughs> surprisingly enough, when I was here at Santa Barbara, somebody came on campus and tried to sell marijuana, and the students turned them in. <laughs> this was all made out of a very strong wool. Did your art history background, does it, does it come up into play when you're on Oh, it's, it still does. Yeah. I mean, I still, when I, I, I still go through art history books. I love it. It's, uh, and I'd say there, there isn't anything, I don't think. I, you know, I look at, uh, especially like the Borgs. The Borgs have been copied and duplicated so many times since we did the Borgs. It, uh, it's just that every time I see something, this was a great hairstyle. I love this wig. The, she actually flattened it out, and it was like a giant fan across her head. This happened to be a show that uh, we won an Emmy for that Major Roddenberry starred in, uh, Gene Roddenberry's wife. 
But I mean, I had to keep coming up with these things. How do you even think of this? Uh, um, going through the books, going through, I'd say, pick out a piece from a fish or a, a, a bird and then, you know, combine all these things. This is a body, the body makeup that uh, a dancing girl took about four hours, or about four of us that were working on her for about four hours. Is any of this costume, or is this uh, all No, the, the jewels are. Yeah, okay. the little jewels are on it. So you call out for that, and then the costume Yes, I, wor I worked very, very close. Makeup uh, with me, I had to work very close with the costumer because if I was making an alien and had strange skin, I would have to find out what Bob Blackman was going to expose. Is he going to have their chest showing? Is he going to have their arms showing or their hands? So I would have to come up with... Uh, a skin that will match, uh, you know, their face. This is a, that was a show, this is literally one of my favorite makeups. He's wearing a, a pant that goes from his thigh to his belly button, a chest, a head that has no ears, uh, no nose. Uh, he's wearing uh, gold eyes and the mouth is low. And he couldn't go to the bathroom, he couldn't eat. He couldn't breathe, and he, all day long. But well, uh, well, what do you do? Well, I would eat my sandwich in front of him. Was, uh, I was hungry. But I hope you didn't go to the bathroom in front of him. No, no. <laughs> but I do have a good bathroom story. But, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put that down right after um, Betty Davis and before okay. Marion. <laughs> this guy's eyes. Those are his real eyes. He's, this is the Cardassians. And you see that little spoon in their forehead. Uh, in Studio City, we were going to eat at a Thai restaurant one night. Next door was a, an art gallery. And there was a picture in the window that had a woman with a spoon in the middle of her head. And I said, I'm going to use that someday. Brent Spiner, who played Data, he was my charge. I did Brent over the 18 years of Star Trek. I did him almost every time. I think there's like just a couple that I missed on where I had to do something else. But Brent had these electronics where we would open, that's Brent also when he wow. played his inventor. Wow. But uh, my son Michael built all the electronics for every time we opened data up, Michael built, had the programs and everything that he built for him, whether it was a finger, his head, an arm. There's Armin Shimmerman this is with the Ferengi teeth. And with Renee, who played Odo, it was a full face. There's Hawkins, he came as a guest star. What? Yeah. Oh, everybody wanted to be on the show. It was one morning I said, I said good morning to him, and all of a sudden nothing's coming back. So I, you know, I started to leave, and all of a sudden behind me was good morning, Michael. He had to take and type everything out, and it took a while to, to go through it. This was one of the Star Trek movies, Insurrection. So these are characters from that. Is that a Westmore? No, no, those were actually planned. These were all planned ones where they had the stretched skin on their faces and. But it was a lot of fun, and that's all latex. Is there anything that we did before in a more beta way that now we could do with CG or with uh, Oh, yes. The, and, and, and Almost any of this. But was there something that was better before that we, w that we should go back to, wax or latex? No, 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 I, it's, no it's I think, really, I think, really has progressed. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the research that John Chambers did with silicone and uh, has become so standard now. A lot of these things would be silicone today if we were doing them over again. When you look at a character like Voldemort, do you think, oh, they got that from me? No. Okay. No. Because I did when I was seeing oh. the gold guy. Well, you know, I don't know. It's... I don't want to say. These were, these were, you know, great beauty makeups that went along with uh, the, the heads. And, and Brent wore his yellow contact lenses throughout the entire time. Funny man, we would sit and would joke around. This is another one of the Star Trek movies, Nemesis. This is one of my sketches that I would, I would sketch things out. I would do sketching at four in the afternoon. I always planned to sketch between four and five if I had to come up with a new alien because the phone didn't ring that much and uh, my assistant could take care of everything. So that's creativity time and that's why I would go crazy when somebody would come to me and say, well, and I did have a guy who said, he didn't feel, I asked him if he had finished something. He said, well, I didn't really feel creative today. And, uh, you know, when you're on an hourly rate, you feel creative 24-7. Is 4 o'clock still a magic hour for you? 
creativity? No, four o'clock's time to watch Judge Judy. Uh-huh. <laughs> You've earned it. <laughs> Marina and Gates McFadden. Marina was actually on her way out when she got this job. She had been here a year and hadn't gotten any work, and she had her ticket, actually, when she got hired to do this. Now, these are the Borgs, which are some of my favorites. Uh, my son, Michael, uh, here's an eye. Here's the sculpting the eye that's in the Borgs. And then we would make a mold on that, make those out of rubber, and paint them like metal. But Michael would take and fix, uh, fit electronics into them, all the little blinky lights and everything. And we had 32 of those. These are the side pieces, the sculptures on the side pieces. And as Michael continued to do them, he kind of got bored after one or two and decided to put Morris code into them. So every single boar guy spells out somebody's name, including his dog. <laughs> and hidden in these things are messages, which I found, one of them says Westmore's Barbecue. <laughs> it's, it's hard to find, but once you know what it is and you see it, you know. So Jake got bored too, uh, bored. I just talked to him the other day. I said, Jake, what are all the things you put in there? And but, he gave me. And they were all in Morris, all in dots and dashes? No, in the Borg eyes. The electronics oh. were in there. But as far as in these things here, uh, not this piece in particular, but some of the other ones, Jake has little messages sculpted into them. Well, that's one of the big treats of being in the entertainment industry is you can honor your friends and family, <laughs> hide their names in places. You know, it occurs to me as I look at this, it's at the risk of being hyperbolic, it's like you're Da Vinci. You're sketching yeah. and you're inventing well, and true. you're you executing little, little and sculpting. It's yeah. really That's what I try to pass on, with, on, on Face Off. I try to, that they, they have to do everything. On top of that, which I'm always amazed at, and they do this all in 21 hours, they've got to come up with a costume to go with all of it. So it's very d easy for them to uh, get off track and, and get behind schedule. This was a section when the uh, Borg Queen was going to turn Data into a human. And that's a, an arm he had to slip on. She also, um, in her magical way, hair started to grow. So I had all these different sleeves. That one all lit up, but he could literally slide his arm into it, and then we would blend off the edges on each end. There's a whole head section. Now that was made, that was, we started to get into silicone at the very end. Um, the show finished up in season four on Enterprise. It was scheduled to go for another three years, but it just, it kind of wore itself out. So we, we probably would have gone more into silicone makeups uh, had the show progressed. It's Alice Krieg, great actress, and she suffered. Those lenses were made at Nassau. And with LeVar, that's a pattern that I designed, and I had contact lenses made with that pattern in them when he finally decided he didn't want to wear his banana eyepiece anymore, his banana clip. Are there any great internet websites in this, in this field that if we wanted to just do some more cruising around I this think weekend? You, I think you just have to go and, and punch it in. I, I mean, yep. nothing, I, I have a, uh, a, a cousin in Arizona that's uh, kind of like the family bookkeeper, or, or, you know, and she, she finds things everywhere. She found, and this is really strange, my, since my father died and I was a baby, I've never seen him in 3D. Never saw, in, uh, you know, a live thing of him. I was born in 38. This film is from 1934. And he is sitting, gluing a beard on himself, and he's sitting next to Buster Keaton, and he's gluing a beard on himself, and the two of them are doing this funny act together. It's like, I actually got to see my father live. In action. In action. Mm. You know, it was, uh, so it, these things are there if you just just search. It's, it strikes me that yeah. that kind of a yeah. compilation, a family compilation, yeah. your, your family home movies yeah. is something that I think yeah. everyone in this yeah. room wants to see. She, she found another one where they, when they were shooting the picnic scene for Gone with the Wind, 
and my father is powdering, the, they're outside under the trees and everything, and Gable's sitting there and everybody else, and my dad's powdering Maureen O'Hara's nose. Mm. So it's like all these little things are out there, and you wonder, where do they come from? You know, I, this, this way, I mean, I'm fascinated with the computer. It's like Marion has to tell me so many times, don't open everything, you know. <laughs> CGI? Doing CGI in Avatar. We had, we had a big meeting. When, the, when that came out, there was a big meeting that said, what do you do about makeup with um, CGI? Because it isn't. It's all done in the computer. And basically, if there is CGI, it's not considered makeup. But if there is makeup along in the film with the CGI, that makeup will be considered. But that's pointed out. Now, the only drawback to that is, is if that film is put on the makeup category for the makeup, there's no explanation that tells all the voters, don't look at the CGI. At the CGI you know, part. it's like going to court. Well, you don't don't listen to that. It's it's difficult. But the CGI, what it's done is been able to create characters we can't do with makeup. And we have a few of them in Star Trek. You're able to take and stretch the neck. You're able to take and make longer fingers that actually work. You can do so much wonderful things with CGI that it's, uh, we, we found it's just, it's a good combination. Honey, can you think of anything? No, it's just more painful for the people that are... It's more painful for Marion because it will be, uh, I'll say, look at the lace on that mustache and I've just ruined it for her because now she looks at the lace on the mustache the rest of the movie. Um, it's, I, I can't think of any really, but it, it, is, it does, it, it, it ruins the movie for me. So that would be something that would be an example. If yeah. you can see the lace on the hairpiece, that's going to take you out of I it. I mean, you, you see a mic shadow going mm -hmm. through, which you see more on television than you do. Usually on features, they'll catch that. So you've got and, super, super vision. Yeah, I, I try to really just enjoy the film. Mm -hmm. So it has, to, it has to really be bad to jump out at me. To, uh, and then I can't keep my mouth shut, and then I ruin it for Marion, too. So it's, yeah. you know, but, um, but those films come out where I'm saying there's people that will accept second quality as opposed to, you know, doing it again, shooting it one more time. But, you know, a lot of that also comes from uh, a production when they say, you have to shoot 12 pages a day, and so they don't have time uh, and they have to finish at 8 o'clock, they, and they really should go to 8.30 or 9 to get all the work in, and the, the money people come in and say, that's it. Yeah. Uh, it happened on Masters of the Universe, actually. They, they were able to cut the film together, and it worked. But we finished a couple days early, and Canon Productions, who are no longer in business, um, wouldn't let them finish the script. So then you have to do it all retroactively. Yeah, you have to yeah. kind of create it with yeah, what you've got. Yeah. Well, I've learned so much. I've learned eyebrow geometry, the 20 minute rule. <laughs> this, is, this has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Well, I've enjoyed it, I hope you have. Thank you so much. so honored to have yeah. you back at UCSB and we hope that you'll come back and bring more I'd love to. knowledge yeah. and, and, and stories. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you, Michael Westmore. Okay. You really wrapped it up beautifully. Thank you. Thank you.